I want to talk about basic phytology. So I wanted to remind you what ecology was. Biology, dealing with the relationships and interactions between organisms and their environment, including other organisms. So you get interactions with the environment, like interactions with the water, water quality. We're going to talk about water quality today. Everything from light penetration to temperature, different elements of water quality. All of that is interactions that these fish have to go through when we talk about the ecology of ponds and climate management the way we do. And then we interact with the other organisms. There are predators out there, obviously largemouth bass is one of them. Uh, but really almost all of our fish are predators that we put out there. There's a lot of competitors and that's something that's really important in the way we stock because most of our stocking recommendations are based on not having too much competition for our bass. I mean that's critical. Right, that you don't outcompete them so much, and uh, and talk about other things like like their prey items, and, and we'll get into plants and the importance of plants, of some types of plants, and that sort of thing. So all of that's ecology, all of those interactions with the with other living things and with the physical environment, and so I think that's critical to understanding how uh, how our recommendations work and why we make the recommendations we do. Some of y'all may know that. Uh, Pond management actually started with Homer Swingle in Alabama at Auburn University back in the 1930s. And he was a uh, cotton entomologist. He was studying uh, uh, boll weevils. And, but he loved the fish. And he convinced the guy at Auburn, the director of the dean college, to build him a few ponds and he'd manage them and, and the dean and he and other administrators could go fishing. The dean did it and Swingle tried to manage them and they were terrible failures. And he was a perfectionist, and it frustrated him so much, he started really the science of the private impoundment management. And it is a science. We've been doing it now for 80-some years, and lots of research goes on. And that's what we try to bring today, the technology, the research that we've learned over 80 years of experimentation and experience that we think works. And there's a lot of misunderstandings out there, and these are some of them that hopefully a speaker or two, including me today, will... Uh, will cover, and, and you may have this misunderstanding, that's fine, you know, um, and these are not all of them <laughs> by any means, it's just kind of my pet peeve list, I guess, of uh, common misunderstandings that people have about managing uh, these private waters. Okay, I like to start with a reality check just on fish in general. One thing is fish are cold-blooded creatures and that means they do not keep their body the way we do with calories from the foods we eat. They are the temperature of their environment. Right now today I would guess that most of our private ponds are sitting around 70 degrees roughly. Moss or minus a little bit. And so every fish, let's just say it's 70 degrees, every fish out there is 70 degrees. There's not one that's 72 degrees and there's not one that's 68 degrees. And that temperature drives everything. That temperature drives their heart rate, it drives their guilt, uh, rate, their breathing rate. It drives how much they will eat or how much they won't eat, how hungry they are. It drives when they want to reproduce. That temperature is one of the most critical things. I'll show you something about that in a minute. But the big thing about being a cold-blooded animal is without heating your body, you don't need near as much energy. In fact, the estimates are that 80 to 90 percent of a mammal like ourselves 80%, 80 to 90% of the calories we eat simply go into maintaining our body temperature. Now think of that. If you were a cold-blooded animal, you could automatically eat 80 or 90% less than you eat today. If that's the case, do you need to eat every day? No. And most fish don't eat every day. A lot of fish don't eat once a week. Some may not eat once a month. It's a very different world. Because if you don't need energy to heat your body and you don't need the energy to stand up against gravity, you float, then your energy demands are very, very, very low, really. But the trouble is then, um, you don't always grow well if you don't get enough to eat. And that's the most common thing we see in most private impoundments when it comes to a fish problem is we see fish that aren't growing at their potential, at the rate they should be growing at if they have enough to eat. And so we see stunted situations, and we'll talk more about that. Stunted bass is probably the most common thing we see 
as far as a fish problem in most private waters. The other thing is the kind of fish that we stock in these ponds don't chew their food. They actually can't move their jaw sideways. It's not possible. It's not physically possible. Open and close it, but can't chew. They also don't have those kind of teeth. They don't have molars and things like that, right? The kind of fish we, we stock. And so that makes it, and most people haven't thought about this, that if you can't chew your food, you basically have to swallow it whole. I ate a cookie while ago. I didn't swallow that whole, did I? So, so think about that. What size you eat, then a prey, and that's what these animals are, is, is, is predators, is determined pretty much by mouth size. And if you can't outswim it, chase it down, and swallow it whole, you don't eat. That makes a tremendous difference in the way we have to think about this and therefore the way that we manage these waters is to keep that in mind that these animals they're i get this all the time well i see lots of minnows in the pond well they're probably not minnows but anyway uh they may be the wrong size and just because they're there doesn't mean anything can eat them all right um, so again out swim and swallow whole keep that in mind this is that temperature idea, and this just shows you kind of a general thing about fish and how fast they will grow. And really, this really should be kind of appetite if you really think about it, how much they desire to eat and then how, how fast they will grow based on temperature. I don't have the temperature lines down here, but uh, this is roughly in the upper 60s to mid to low, uh, mid 70s, the spawning temperature, of course. And, and, and again, fish really grow well in this temperature from about 70 to to 85 or 90 degrees. There is an upper lethal temperature and a lower lethal temperature, and of course there's a spawning range of temperatures. Again, temperature drives that, drives their heartbeat, drives their breathing rate, drives their, their appetite, and that's something that we need to remember. So, we'd all like pretty ponds. This out in the Texas Hill Country, pretty ponds. Got a little green too, a little clearer too, though you can see along the edges. But all the ponds that look that pretty, they want to catch those, right? Well, you're not going to get there by doing nothing, okay? It's like Alan said, this is critical. It's the management. The technology to manage these ponds is the only way you're going to get the good-sized fish, okay? Many of us, how many come from farming and ranching backgrounds? Raise your hands. All right. So a lot of people are used to these kind of animals, cattle and sheep and goats. And again, the disconnect is those are herbivores. Those are not what we're growing in the ponds. We're growing coyotes and bobcats. We're growing carnivores. We're growing predators. And so if you come from a farm and a ranch and background, we've got to have a little different way of thinking about this. I joke sometimes, think about it, you know, cattle go down to almost valueless tomorrow and, and coyote hides are $200 a piece and you decide to change your ranch over to a coyote ranch, you know, you're going to have to do things a little different. And so, Again, when we think about the ecology of these ponds and how we manage them and why we, why we do the things we do, we've got to keep this in our heads that we are working with predators. They're not plant eaters. Okay? Okay, my common misunderstanding or uh, common management that we've got to understand is that it's based on food then. We've got to feed these animals if they're going to grow. So the question then becomes how do we develop a strong food chain? A natural food chain or maybe semi-artificial food chain that gets to these enough food to eat. And that's the major question. And then what's going to compete with them to get that food? Or, you know, what species should we stock and what species should we not stock? I mean, I think those are critical questions. And it all, again, boils down to interactions and ecology. Most of us are aware of food chains on land, and they go something like this. We have a plant or plants. Plants are eaten by herbivore, and herbivores are eaten by carnivore. And again, if we do our coyote example, we could, uh, if we want to grow coyotes, we'd grow grass maybe and stock rabbits, and then the coyotes would eat the rabbits, and we would sell coyote hides, right? Well, that, that works. That's a terrestrial food chain. Obviously, that's, that's, that's something we see every day. Well, in the water, we have the same sort of thing. We have plants, and we have herbivores, and we have carnivores. That may be an example of being uh, 
and we eat plants and snails and some fish, but that's a terrible example. Because snails often carry parasites, you may not want those out there. But in the aquatic world, there's another step, and it's, it happens on, on land too, in terrestrial environments, but it's called the tritus. The tritus is dead material, particularly dead plant material. We have a whole group of animals that we call the tritivores then, that eat the tritus, dead material. And these become extremely important, and I'll talk about that in a second. So this may be the kind of food chain we develop in with algae. Uh, farming dead algal cells, which is detritus, those feeding all kinds of things from worms up to maybe as big as crayfish, and then of course those feeding the fish. And once you get into that, it's a fish eats fish world, right? I mean, largemouth bass are piscivores, they eat other fish, including their own. And so once we get that far along, we, we, we've got a pretty good food chain back. So let's talk about that. One of the best ways to manage these private impoundments is a green water management strategy. As human beings, most of us don't like green water because we can't see down into it, we think it's ugly. But why, as a rancher, if you look out on your pasture and it's beautiful green and it's two feet high, what, you don't think that's ugly, right? This, you know, green water, in a way, algae is the equivalent of grass, the ecological equivalent of grass. And so you need that mindset to change. Green water is productive water. It's rich. It's got life. It's got plant life, abundant plant life. It's got grass. Okay? Well, but fish don't eat it. Right? So, oh, I've got to have that one in there. This is clear water. What is that? It's a plowed field. Do you see any plant life in there? No. Clear water is the same way. It's clear because there's not any plant life in it. Usually, of course, maybe rooted plants, in it. but anyway, we'll talk about that later too. But again, clear water may be real aesthetically pleasing, may be real pretty to look at, may like to wade out and see our toes at waist deep, but it doesn't make it productive. Okay, go back to the green water. The fish don't eat that. That's right. But there's all kinds of things out there that are really tiny that do eat it. We call them zooplankton. Plankton means floating, zo means animal. They're floating animals. They're, they're actually our grazers, our herbivores. They're pretty tiny. If we magnify them, and that's one millimeter, if anybody knows how big that is, under a microscope, that's what some of them look like. What does that one in the middle look like to you? If you had to say what is that related to, what would you say? A cockroach or a shrimp, I heard somebody say. I'll, I'll pick shrimp, just, just out of the heck of it. Because that is a crustacean, actually, up there in the photograph. So here is the equivalent, believe it or not, of cattle, sheep, goats, horses, you know, herbivores on land. These are our herbivores in the water. They're just a whole lot smaller. But they eat algae. You say, well, that's fine and good, but that's not feeding my five-pound bass. And you're right, it's not. But guess what it does feed? It feeds young fish and it feeds certain species like your bluegill here, feeds them until they're quite large because that's what one of their sources of food is zooplankton, especially when they first hatch. Again, think about this. This animal hatches out from an egg and it's less than a quarter inch long, right? It's swimming out there looking for something to eat and it is a predator. What's it gonna eat? Those. That's exactly what it eats. If you don't have enough green water, you don't have enough zooplankton production, these guys starve to death. Those guys are the same way. When they first hatch out, they eat zooplankton. Again, if you don't have enough algae to feed the zooplankton, these guys start to perish. They don't get enough to eat. Once they get about this size, they start converting over to eat something else. But for the first stages of life, almost all fish eat zooplankton. That's the big thing. Then they move on. What do they move on to? Well, let's talk about the tritus. Remember the word tritus, dead stuff? Here's a leaf. And that's not necessarily the best example, but it photographs well. And you know as well as I do, if you walk out here under one of these trees and you found a leaf on the ground, you picked it up and you found the same kind of leaf over here in the water in the pond, you picked it up, what would that leaf in the pond feel like? It would be slimy, right? That slime is living. That slime is living organisms 
breaking that leaf down. Some of them are protozoan, there's bacteria, there's fungi, but it's living, that slime is alive. That slime is food. Again, that fish or even the worm can't digest that dead leaf. They can't digest cellulose, but they can eat and digest the fungus and the bacteria and the protozoans that are digesting that leaf. Okay? Then we get a whole myriad of insects and crustaceans and worms and mollusks that feed upon that detritus. The biggest one being a crayfish. Crawdad, mud bug, whatever you want to call it. In fact, that's the way we culture. When we farm crawfish, we grow rice, cut the, the, the head off the rice for us to eat, leave the stubble. The stubble then sits under water and forms detritus and the crayfish. That's the biggest part of their diet. It's not the only part of their diet, but that's the biggest part of their diet is detritus. The rice stubble as it decomposes. So now I think we're starting to see things that maybe fish can eat, right? Getting on up there. And again, that's what our bluegill eats, that's what our young bass eats until they can finally get big enough to start eating other fish or find fish the right size to swallow whole. So now we're working our way up and particularly our sunfish species are big workers on the tritivores. They're big wormers and buggers is what I call them. They eat a lot of worms and bugs. And believe it or not, in the bottom of that pond, if you have detritus, especially from algal death, algal cell death, you have tons and tons of worms and bugs, and that's what these guys feed upon. Again, look at the size of that mouth. You know, this is not something that eats something that weighs two pounds, right? It's got to eat something small. It's a predator. It's looking for worms and bugs. Think about what we fish for these things with. Worms and crickets, right? They recognize that. It's part of their diet. It's, it is their diet. Well, they eat fry. <coughs> sure, they'll eat other fish fry and stuff. Yeah. One of the things you got that I hear a lot of people do wrong, and I don't want to digress here too much, but... People will stock sunfish say, well, we're not going to stock the bass for two years. We want sunfish to get big. Yeah, then when you stock those little bass, sunfish eat them. You know, you don't want sunfish to become big predators that, that eat your young bass. Anyway, um, but these guys are wormers and buggers, and, and they are the basis of what most of the bass prey on once they get some size on them. So here's what that food chain looks like. We want to grow a one pound bass, that animal has to consume 10 pounds of prey. Swim down, swallow whole, 10 pounds of prey. Well, to the grow 10 pounds of bluegill in this case, they've eaten this zooplankton, the worms, the insects, maybe a little crustaceans. To get 10 pounds of these guys, and that's a lot of them, they've eaten 100 pounds of their prey. And to get 100 pounds of those, it's taken 1,000 pounds of detritus or the paraphyton was the name for what the slime is. Um, or if, if in some cases they eat plants directly, they've eaten plants. So think about this. We all want 10 pound bass, right? You know we do. Okay, so for that animal to grow to 10 pounds within its lifetime of eight or 10 years, it's had to outswim and swallow whole 100 pounds of prey. It's not easy. It is possible, but it takes management. It doesn't just happen by accident unless you've got an enormous lake and then a few will make it. But this is not a given. It takes management. That's what this conference is about. But again, just keep that in mind. 10 pounds, 100 pounds that it has to outswim, chase down and swallow whole or it does not eat or does not grow. So this is again, the problem that we see is poor condition or stunted bass. Usually with a bass, for some reason, when they're stunted really badly, the tail looks too big. But again, if you can take your finger and punch him in the belly and hit his backbone, the light ought to come on and he's not eating anything. These are predators. They do not suffer from anorexia. They do not go on diets. These are eating machines. A good friend of mine, his father, just one time said, I wish I'd have thought of it because I heard the quote. 
But he said, you know, it's a good thing bass don't get to 200 pounds and eat our children. Yeah. Well, he's right. You know, a little 40 pound kid jumps in the tank to swim around and 200 pound bass just suck him up and just be another meal. These guys do not go on diets. They do not suffer psychological problems. So when you see one that's got a big tail, that's got a skinny belly, a skinny body, he is a stunted animal and he may be quite old. The worst I ever saw was a pond outside of Somerville, Texas. This was a long time ago. We would throw a lure out there and you would feel all the little pings but you couldn't catch anything. So then we put on a little lure, caught eight inch bass. Took them back and aged them, they were eight years old. There were a whole lot of them in there. Everybody finally trying to find something to eat, finding enough two or three meals a year to stay alive, but no way to grow. All right. Crappie are one of the classic examples of that in most small impoundments. And that's because crappie really over reproduce. A female bass on average, and all of this stuff is an average, will produce about 3,000 eggs per pound of body weight. So a five pound female bass, about 15,000 eggs. Obviously, they don't all survive. They get eaten by their own. But a female crappie, one pound, has the potential, and that's not a one pounder, has the potential, look, look the bill, has the potential to spawn 100,000 eggs or more. And fishermen know who spawns first, crappie or bass, crappie. So think about that. I've got one single crappie out there in that two acre pond and she's spawned and she's produced a hundred thousand fry out there eating zooplankton. A few weeks later, my bass spawn what's left. Crappie grow up for a while and get to about that size and they're three years old because there's too many mouths all the same size and not enough to eat. It's really food in for growth. So that's one of the reasons we don't recommend crappie stocking because sure, I, you can, I can take you to a pond that's got nice crappie and it's five acre pond. It's the exception. It's the rare exception where something happens in that spawning that most of the eggs die. But we can't replicate that. We can't predict that. We can't guarantee it. So it's a bad idea. I love crappie. I love fish crappie. I'll go out here to the big lake and fish for crappie, not put it in your small impoundment. Okay, so why do we stock and what do we stock based on kind of that idea that there could be problems with uh, competition, right? Well, this is Lake Athens or any of our public reservoirs. What is it? It's a whole bunch of predators out there competing and fighting and eating with each other. We know on land that would not work, right? I assume we know that wouldn't work. But that's pretty much what our public reservoirs and our public waters are because what do we have? Well, we have largemouth bass, we may have spotted bass, we got 20 kinds of sunfish, we got gar, we got yellow cat, we got blue cat, we got channel cat, we got black crappie, we got white crappie. You know, do I need to go on? Every one of those is a predator. That's what that world looks like. Is that productive? Well, not if what we really want is just good bass, it isn't. But that's the reality of the real world. Let's cut that reality down to something that works better for the production of bass. Okay? And so it's the KISS principle. Keep it simple. Find fish that work together to get us to that ultimate good bass growth. Okay, and we do that then based on fertility as far as stocking. This is per surface acre new pond stocking recommendations. And again, not all ponds can be fertilized or should be fertilized. So we have recommendations on whether it's gonna be a fertile system. And some ponds are naturally fertile. They're kind of rare, but it happens. Uh, and these are our general recommendations. 100 bass per surface acre. If we don't fertilize or feed, we're going to cut that down to half, 50. There's not going to be as much food. We don't need to stock as many animals. 1,000 sunfish or 500. Most of those sunfish are bluegill. They can all be bluegill. Or we can use a com combination of bluegill and red hair at a four to one ratio. 
We like to add fathead minnows to a brand new pond, and we can do catfish if we want. I should have put 50 down here if we wanted to. But this animal is our key. Okay, now I'm going to pick on everybody. Raise your hands if that is a perch. Come on. Come on. I grew up in West Texas. I know they're perch. Come on, raise your hands. So I can pick on them. All right. This is a centrarchid sunfish. Okay? A perch has a long, narrow body style, kind of like a minnow, maybe. And most of the ones we have here in Texas are pretty much creek fish, and they're small and all that. But you can go up north, and you can catch a yellow perch, or you can catch a walleye. That's a perch. These are not perch. These are sunfish. So, uh, you know, I like to joke that perch are skinny Yankee fish, okay? We don't have perch here in our top ponds in Texas. We have sunfish. And so calling this animal a perch, you know, education is a dangerous thing. That's the trouble. I was educated, and I know this in the perch. Calling this thing a perch is like me walking up to your prize scimitar bull and saying, nice horsey. You know, it's just wrong, okay? So we're not going to say perch anymore today, I hope. Uh, these are sunfish. But this one is the key, bluegill sunfish. 85 years of research, we've never found an animal that's going to work better in a small private impoundment by itself with bass than this one. Three reasons. Small mouth, not a big competitor, except when the bass is small. Um, huge size, right? Expect some 10-pound bluegill out there? I don't think so. What do they do? They, they stay relatively small, don't they? I mean, we're going to get a few nice big ones, probably, hopefully. Those are our spawners. We need them. But the vast majority of them are going to stay pretty small. Again, if I've got to outswim this animal and swallow him whole, I can't swallow one that's too big. So we need a prey item, a, a forage item, if you want to be politically correct, that will not outgrow us. And these animals in general don't. But then the third characteristic is the best. The female sunfish, the female bluegill, is a multiple spawner. She doesn't spawn once a year like a bass or like a crappie or like a catfish or whatever. They're annual spawners. This little female will spawn three to five times, depending on conditions of weather and all that, a year. Well, folks, that's our rabbit. We, if we got to get 10 pounds of prey to grow one pound of bass, we can't rely on something that just spawns once. We've got to have multiple spawners. And again, we've never found a better animal that can do that in these private pond conditions, be those three things, not a big competitor, not outgrow in size, and multiple spawn than this animal, bluegill sunfish. And that's all you've got to have, really. Nobody's ever satisfied with that. We're going to talk a lot about alternative stocking later. But if we, if we do it right, that's all we've got to have. And that's what it ends up looking like if you do it right. But the key is selective harvest, and we're going to talk about that later, too. Catch and release is great out here in these public waters. But you catch and release, and that's all you do in your private pond, and you will bring your pond down to a stunning bass condition. Just too many mouths, too much competition with each other. You've got to select the harvest. That's the primary management. Okay, so today we are going to talk about all these other things. We're going to talk about water quality, this pond fertilization, supplemental feeding waste that enhance that food chain like we talked about population assessment and that includes in the harvest recommendations and all that keeping records. Um, we're going to talk about bass genetics. Of course, that's what's going on here at Athens with the Share Lumper program and all that stuff. We're going to talk about the importance of, of looking at your genetics. Trophy bass management, how do you really push this as a trophy? And, not, and, and we realize not everybody here wants trophy management. They just want good fishing, right? But some people do want trophy management. So we'll talk about that some. Uh, we'll talk about it controlling uh, and identifying new wildlife and then aquatic weed management, ID and, and control. Those are some of the major topics today. And of course, we're going to take you out and tour you and show you ways to do some population sampling through uh, SANE. And, and, and then if you really want to go high dollar electric fishing. And we'll also show you how we can age the bass. We're here to do all that. 
today and, and talk about all this. My favorite cartoon. <laughs>